Okay, well, it's now my pleasure to invite Phil Bryant uh, up to share. Phil is no stranger to us here. He's uh, preached here on several occasions before. Phil, I was trying to remember how long you've been in the West. I know that you studied in Queensland. You originally served over in Victoria. But Lakeside was your first posting here, wasn't it, all those years ago? That's right. Um, but I am a West Australian. I grew up here until I was 15. So. I didn't know that. There you go. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> and I know that you were teaching down at Kerry Baptist. You had uh, several years, many years, as a church health consultant That's for right. the Baptist Churches of WA. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that you've also been a chaplain for, um, what's that basketball team called? <laughs> Yeah, Perth Wildcats. I'll oh, yeah, be there this is. afternoon. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And tell us, where are you presently? Uh, at present, I um, have a role as an executive chair of the boards of Kennedy and Mandurah Baptist Colleges. So I'm kind of leading that with principals yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis accountable to me. Yeah, great. So that's great. Wonderful. Well, it's a privilege to have you share this morning. Thanks. You're, you're welcome. Uh, open your hearts to Phil. Uh, he's a godly man with a wonderful track record, and I look forward to what God has got to say to us today. Thank Thanks, you. Paul. Thanks for the opportunity of uh, being able to share with you again. It's been great to be here. It's been good to be part of uh, the induction of Neil this morning and uh, Paul, colleagues from a long time ago, so it's been great. If you've got your Bibles, you might like to turn to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to be focusing on uh, verses 9 to 13 this morning. I think it should be on the screen as well. But um, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the disciples saw, they asked his disciples, when the Pharisees saw, they asked his disciples, what does your teacher, um, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what that means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You know, being a pastor has its upsides and its downsides. Uh, the upside is that uh, certainly once upon a time you could go and visit a, a doctor or a dentist and they might offer their services for free, um, sometimes. <laughs> uh, I can tell you what never happened is that you would go and visit... Uh, the car dealership or the computer shop and they didn't offer any services for free. <laughs> On the downside, some people feel uncomfortable around me because I'm a pastor. Uh, when they find out what I do, they start apologising for their swearing. Or if they're smokers, they put their cigarettes out or even worse, they put the cigarette behind their back and you can see the smoke coming up the top but they think they're hiding it. Uh, and when some people hear about my occupation, they just change the topic and others just, they kind of drift away quietly. They want nothing to do with me. Even though I thought I was a pretty likeable guy, and from, my wife says that I am from time to time. You know, what bothers me though, is when I read the New Testament, and I read the account of Jesus, and I read about his life, and what I find about Jesus is quite the opposite. People who were nothing like Jesus, liked him. You know, they weren't just polite, they really liked Jesus. They felt comfortable around him. They actually invited him into their homes and then they invited their friends into their homes to meet him. And more than that, Jesus liked people who were nothing like him. Jesus was just as comfortable with them as they were with him. And maybe... He was even more comfortable with them. Uh, but over and over we see Jesus, God in a body, mixing with people who admitted that they were nothing like him. Jesus was righteousness personified, but he was comfortable with those who were very unrighteous. And if that wasn't strange enough, Jesus then turned to some of these people and invited them and said, follow me. You know, John was one of Jesus' earliest disciples and he watched Jesus interact with people that were part of the religious system. And uh, John attended parties with Jesus and he was in 
people's homes, the homes of people that his mother's actually warned him to not be in, you know, warned him about those people. But, but John was taken out of his comfort zone time and time again, so much so that he probably felt like he was looting, losing his religious identity. You see, Jesus was like no other rabbi that John had ever come across in his life. He was an extraordinarily devout person, but spent little time with the devout men of Israel. Jesus was just as comfortable teaching in the synagogue as he was with the notorious sinners. Listen to John's assessment of Jesus in, first, in John chapter 1, verse 14. He says this, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, Jesus was God's Son. He is the saviour of the world. But notice that, Paul, that John says there that he came full of grace and truth. Jesus didn't come to strike a balance between grace and truth. It says that Jesus came and brought the full measure of grace and truth. And John in his life watched Jesus apply grace and truth to each person that he came across. John was there when Jesus extended the, his grace-filled invitation to the most unimaginable person in Israel, a Jewish tax collector named Levi. Who was Levi? Well, Levi was probably loathed more than most people in Israel. In fact, Levi probably even loathed the person that he'd become. You see, maybe it was only a matter on, on which he and both the people in the synagogue and the Pharisees agreed. But despite Levi's Jewish background, despite his Jewish name, despite his, the Jewish blood pumping through his veins, despite the Jewish culture that was oozing out of every pore in his body, Levi would, could not have felt more out of place than in the promised land. You see, Levi's upbringing taught him to reverence the piety of the Pharisees. But you see, what he'd seen was the hypocrisy. And that's what turned his stomach. These outwardly religious men made a great show of religion. They devoted the majority of their day to self-cleansing rituals and uh, public obedience to the law. The Pharisees had no time to earn a living and so they relied on donations that came from the working class. And as the working class gave the donations and they lived off those donations... They then uh, took in one hand the donations, but then with the other hand pointed the finger at the working class. You see? And then there was the aristocratic Sadducees of the time. They understood the times better than anyone. And that, in fact, they'd come to terms with the facts of life in Israel. Rome ruled Israel. And nothing short of a miracle was going to change that. For the Sadducees, the choice was simple. Oppose Caesar's iron-clad fist and be destroyed or go with the flow. And so the Sadducees chose to go with the flow. They worked out how to turn their situation into a source of income, and so they realised that Rome wanted money, and the Jews wanted independence. So the Sadducees satisfied the needs of both parties by presenting themselves as Jews, representing Rome in paid political positions. Unlike the Pharisees, they didn't hide their motives. It was just about money. They never gave up hope of a free Israel, but they saw cooperation with Rome as making the best of the local situation. Levi found the Sadducees open greed easier to cope with than the Pharisees' hip hypocrisy, and so easy that he became like them. You see, he worked for the Romans. He became a tax collector. And tax collectors were universally hated in the Roman Empire because they were corrupt. Rome demanded a specific quota of money each month, but the tax collector could use the Roman authority which they had to, get as, to extort as much as they could from the people that they served. The tax portion went to Rome, the rest made the tax collector rich. To maximise their profit, the tax collector would 
had to create enough fear in the local people to keep the money flowing, but not enough fear to get themselves killed. And there's another reason that tax collectors were hated. You see, to become a tax collector, a person had to buy into the business. They had to buy it from the Roman government. And the finance to purchase the business, well, the Jew would, Jew would raise that by selling some of his land or mortgaging it. But every Jew's identity was tied up with the land. This land was their land. It was the promised land. And so to sell some of the promised land meant that they were selling their birthright. In other words, they were selling themselves. And the Jews saw tax collectors as traitors. You see, because they had betrayed the people, they'd betrayed their heritage, they'd betrayed the temple, and they'd betrayed their God. Levi's parents, by the way, they named him after the third son of Jacob, who was the father of the Israelite tribe of Levi. Levi. See, when the Israelites worshipped the golden calf, the tribe of Levi was the only tribe that remained faithful to God. And as a reward for their faithfulness, God appointed the tribe of Levi as priests over the nation. And the role of priests became increasingly important within the Jewish religion. The people came to the priest when, they, when their sin uh, required the payment of an animal sacrifice. The priests were attendants in the temple. It was the high priest who went into the Holy of Holies once a year to make atonement for the sins of the people. And for any Jew to abandon his heritage to become a tax collector, that was an unforgivable sin. But for a member of the tribe of Levi to do so, well, that was beyond comprehension and it was also beyond forgiveness. A priest was like a go-between between God and the people. A tax collector served as a go-between between the Roman treasury and Rome. You see, no doubt Levi felt guilty. No doubt he felt guilty. Every time a Jewish festival came around, that was his heritage. I got no doubt... He felt guilty every time he wrote his name, Levi. He knew the significance of that. He knew that it brought back to him who he was born to be and who he'd become. At the same time, Levi knew enough about what went on behind the scenes of his religion to know that the leaders there were corrupt, just as corrupt as him. In his mind, he was a sinner, but he wasn't a hypocrite. With Levi's background, imagine how stunned he was when the most dynamic and prominent religious teacher in all of Galilee invited him to become one of his followers. Levi never received invitations to religious events. Jesus' invitation must have pretty much knocked the socks off him. But Jesus' invitation was just the beginning of a series of of new experiences that would lead Levi to becoming a completely different person with a new name. You see, eventually he became known as Matthew. And he would write the first gospel, the good news of Jesus. And he would write it from a Jewish perspective. Matthew's first encounter with Jesus came in Capernaum. Maybe the news spread to him about the paralytic man that Jesus had told your sins are forgiven but Matthew describes his first encounter with these words in Matthew chapter 9 verse 9 he says as Jesus went on from there that's healing the paralytic he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth now I want you to imagine the scene the lowest of the low a traitor to his people a ceremonially unwashed moral failure looks up from his corrupt tax ledger to see God in a body coming towards him. To see pure righteousness coming his way. What would pure righteousness say to a Jew who had sold his soul to Rome? Sold his soul to Rome for the right to fleece 
his own countrymen. But just remember that Jesus didn't travel alone. He also would have seen some of Jesus' followers, the ones that he had already chosen. You know, James and John, pretty volatile guys. These were the guys that tried to call down fire on a village that didn't give hospitality to Jesus. I mean, we don't know whether Simon Zealot had been called at this time, but he fought for a guerrilla movement who killed Roman sympathisers. And what about Peter? He had a habit of engaging his mouth before he engaged his mind. What would these outspoken men say as they passed Matthew's tax booth? And before they could fling an insult at Levi or say a word, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, follow me. Interesting, the same words that he had used to invite James and John and Peter and probably Simon. But their invitations to follow Jesus actually kind of made sense anyway, didn't they? I mean, they all came from a devout Jewish family. They, they uh, lived and they worked and they worshipped in Capernaum. I mean, they, they were hardworking and they were middle-class Jews and they remained loyal to their heritage and they remained loyal to their God. I mean, they prayed for the coming of the Messiah and in Simon's case, they fought for the liberation of Israel. Imagine their reaction when Jesus invites a tax collector to join his inner circle. It's interesting that years later when Matthew started uh, his book about the, his life with Jesus, he did a very strange thing. And if you've read the book, you'll understand what I mean. He began with the genealogy of Jesus. He started with Abraham and he traced Jesus' ancestry through 40 generations until he got to Joseph, the husband of Mary. Now, when I read that, I think it was more than just to show that Jesus was a Jew. Matthew went out of his way to spice up the list. He put in a couple of shady ladies. He made a couple of uh, editorial notes in there. Matthew was about to tell an epic story of God's grace. He was about to suggest that God would actually forgive even the most serious sins. He was about to tell us that God chose and used the most inappropriate people. He was about to tell us that God was concerned about Gentiles as well as Jews. You see, Matthew knew better than most by this time that this is a story of God drawing near to those who had been pulled away by sin and pushed away by the self-righteous. See, Jesus' lineage that Matthew outlined provided us with information that showed us that Jesus was authentically Jewish. He was undeniably kingly. And most important of all, he was born into a lineage of people who desperately needed the grace of God. Matthew's story was written for Jews. And when the Jews read Jesus' lineage, they would have been well aware that he was descended from some really colourful characters. They would have been aware that there were liars in there. There were swindlers in there. There were lawbreakers. There was a murderer. There was a slave trader. There was an adulterer. There was a prostitute. And there was a non-Jew. Imagine. I can imagine as Matthew was sitting down writing this, that he's smiling, thinking to himself, these are my kind of people. At least they were his kind of people up until the day he met Jesus. See, the grace point of this event is Jesus' human ancestry includes flawed and fallen people. First century Jews needed to hear that message. And I think 21st century people need to hear, need to hear that message too. When Jesus began his ministry... He found the nation of Israel was divided over the issue of how a person could be right with God. What he found was that there were, first of all, there was the self-righteous people, those who thought that they could be right with God by keeping the law. And 
they had perfected, in some sense, the art of self-delusion. I mean, to keep the law, they had actually dumbed down some of the commandments to, to bring them into alignment with their own behaviour, which they, did, had, they had no intention of uh, changing. And, and then there was the unrighteous people. They refused to live in a perpetual state of denial. And, and so, regarding their personal standing with God, they knew that they could never live up to His standards. They knew that they could never be good enough. They knew that they could never earn God's favour by obeying the law. So, they exiled themselves from God. And the two groups, they kept their distance. It was kind of like um, mutual contempt kept them apart. The self-righteous considered themselves better than those who admitted to being unrighteous and the unrighteous felt judged by the self-righteous. And so, but they also knew that the self-righteous were hypocritical. They knew that what they claimed to be, they were not. So Jesus showed up and what he did was that he shone a laser light. He shone a laser light of reality on the self-righteous and offered to the unrighteous who were full of guilt and sent, uh, full of a sense of shame a way back. When Jesus met Matthew, he desperately needed a way back. So Jesus said, follow me. And that's exactly what Matthew did. But it's interesting to note that Jesus didn't take him to the temple. Instead, Jesus invited himself to Matthew's house. And Matthew didn't object. Instead, Matthew got the word out amongst all his mates and he invited them all in. And everybody was there for the party. And before long, Matthew's house was filled with tax collectors and the unrighteous and the undesirable riffraff from around the town of Capernaum. And, and you know, they were the kind of Rahabs. They were the kind of Bathshebas. They were the kind of Judas. They were the Davids that lived in Capernaum. They all showed up for the party. Under the roof, we have pure righteousness dining with unrighteousness on steroids. You know, on that hot afternoon, Levi's home became a place of grace. True righteousness and unrighteousness came together. And Jesus was supremely comfortable with this. See, God in a body was comfortable surrounded by those who most needed a grace bridge back to God. But not everybody felt comfortable as Jesus. Outside the religious icons of the town gathered, you know, the self-righteous. The teachers of the law, the Pharisees. Even if they were invited in, they would never have gone in because, uh, to that home because it was a home of a sinner. And one touch of a sinner like Matthew would make, require of them a washing and ceremonial cleansing that would take hours. You see, their righteousness would have been compromised. And so they huddled together outside and they're grumbling to one another and they started grumbling to some of Jesus' disciples. And in Matthew chapter 9, verse 11, we read them that they said, Why does your teacher... Eat with tax collectors and sinners. Interesting question, isn't that? They couldn't understand how a man who claimed to be from God could get so close to those who were nothing like God. How could a man who seemed nothing like Matthew actually like him? They didn't have a category for this. And when Jesus heard their objections... He sent a message out. We read it in Matthew chapter 9, verse 12. He said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Now here, Jesus is playing on their own categories. You see, they assumed when they heard that, well, we're the healthy. And Levi was the sick. But then Jesus quoted from the Old Testament. He quoted a passage that would have been familiar to them. They knew it. And it went like this from Hosea 6.6. 6, I desire mercy, not sacrifice and see that word mercy there in the Hebrew is the word kesed and it has the whole idea of God's loving faithfulness it carries the idea of God's grace and so maybe we could have could also translate I desire grace not sacrifice here's the point God 
prioritizes grace over sacrifice. Then Jesus shared his one sentence mission statement in Matthew chapter 9, verse 13. He says, For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. See, Jesus is using the word righteous and sinner there. It was his way of saying, I have not come to call those who think they are righteous, but those who know that they are not righteous. See, that's a very uncomfortable truth if we think we're righteous. But grace is inviting to the unrighteous and threatening to the self-righteous. See, Jesus' invitation to Matthew to become his follower, plus his presence in Matthew's home, confirmed beyond all doubt that grace is not earned it's actually offered. This has been true since the Garden of Eden. But this simple message has been buried over the years under a mountain of complexity created by human beings who try to earn their righteousness rather than admit and rest in the truth that there is no righteousness apart from that given by God's grace through Jesus Christ. You see, as his years with Jesus unfolded, Matthew would have had, had this reinforced in his life. He would have seen Jesus as grace personified when Jesus touched the untouchable, when Jesus socialized with those who survived on the margins of society, when Jesus performed miracles in the lives of people who were not righteous and had no means of being able to even pay it. They didn't even deserve miracles. He would have seen Jesus' grace personified when Jesus upheld the law while embracing the lawbreaker. He would have seen Jesus' grace personified as he elevated the status of women and children. As Jesus paid his taxes, grace was personified as Jesus fed strangers, as Jesus loved his enemies. And as Matthew and the rest of the disciples walked from town to town, they would see only one thing, that got Jesus angry. Graceless religion. Graceless religion. His conflict was never with Rome. It was always with the Pharisees and Sadducees and the teachers of the law. Because you see, they knew the stories of God's grace to Israel right throughout Israel's history. It was their responsibility to keep the stories front and center in the people's minds in the nation of Israel, and they had failed. On their watch, a religion without grace had taken over. It was a graceless religion that stirred a righteous anger within Jesus and set him at odds with the religious elite. And eventually it was that religious elite who had Jesus arrested, tried, and crucified. You see, they silenced the voice of grace for a moment. Just for a moment. Matthew, you see, had a ringside seat in all of this. And he was there when Mary announced, the tomb is empty. He was there. He would then see and he would then touch and he would eat with the risen Jesus. He would have the privilege of writing the story of Jesus, a gospel, his gospel, proclaiming a clear message of grace for the world at large. And maybe his gospel should be called the grace gospel. And maybe the commission that Jesus shared right at the end of the gospel, Matthew 28, 19, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Do you see, you know, it said all nations. That's written by Jew. All nations. That's a message. This is a message for everyone. And the key phrase there is make disciples. Literally, it means create followers of Jesus. And that's exactly what Jesus did with Matthew. The process began 
with an invitation, not a command. But the tension between the self-righteous and the unrighteous, I don't think it ended right there with the coming of Jesus. The tension exists today. It still exists today. Put yourself in your, take yourself into that situation. If you'd been invited to Matthew's party, would you have been conflicted? Would your first reaction be to stand outside and, and wonder? Wonder why Jesus would eat with sinners before confronting their sin? Would you be concerned that by not confronting their sin, maybe Jesus was condoning it? Or would you go the other way? Are there things about your lifestyle or, or your past that would cause you to pause about walking into the presence of Jesus at Matthew's party? Would your shame and guilt engulf you? And would you stand tempted outside, just hoping to catch a glimpse, but not make eye contact with Jesus? Who are you? You know who you are. And the chances are, I think that when we look at this, there's probably a little bit of both in us, isn't there? If we admit to ourselves we are judgmental of certain types of people or behaviours, or we put ourselves in, in, in self-imposed exile from the presence of God, either way we well walk the well-worn path of graceless religion. Whichever we choose, we find ourselves further from the grace of God. And you see, the flip side of I'm not worthy, by the way, is but with enough time and with enough effort, I will be. But I think that Matthew, after watching Jesus, would say to us, there's a third way, the way of grace. The way of grace is offered, it's not earned. It's an offering to all people, regardless of who you are, where you've been, or what you've done. So when you catch yourself bouncing between judging others and condemning yourself, pause. Remember, they can't ever be good enough. But also, you can't ever be good enough. But here's the thing, you don't don't have to be. The crucified and resurrected Jesus. Grace invitation is simple. Follow me. Follow me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus. We thank you that as he walked this earth and he came in touch with all kinds of people, that he offered your grace. And as we've heard today, he offered your grace to Matthew. We thank you, Father, that you continue to offer that grace to us today. For those of us who perhaps feel self-righteous, you offer grace. For those of us who feel unrighteous, you offer grace. Father, we pray that you would give us the courage to accept that grace and to walk humbly before you, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Phil. The message is simple. Once for all, Christ's sacrifice made the way for us. We're going to close singing, The Cross Has the Final Word. Please stand. <laughs>